Meine sehr geehrten Ladies and Gentlemen, I would like to use this opportunity to welcome you. As you can see, we're really moving forward very quickly, as intended, but this is a military institution after all, and everybody who's coming through that door will have to bow to this game plan. Now we're talking about strategy consulting uh, by people who are actually doing the job, the practitioners. So this is a decisive issue. And today we have uh, five speakers who will not only well, they who not only have an extraordinary career, but also a lot of experience in this field. So it is owing to their function, but on the other hand, it is also out of their own interest and following their own career. Professor, I'm thinking of you in particular. And there are a lot of people in the room who are knowledgeable about the subject matter, and that takes me to a couple of questions that are related to that. So is strategic consulting desirable or not even wanted? And does this uh, advice uh, arrive at where it's supposed to go or are people recalcitrant and do they resist our advice? What people often say is there is no culture of giving advice. What is meant by that is that the political decision makers don't uh, want to bring in consultants on certain issues and to well get their know-how and then, based on that, to take their decisions. So that takes me to the next question. If you are now in the role of a consultant, it's not only how do you feel as such, but what expectations do you have as a consultant and what expectations are there from the other side of the people who are to receive advice? I believe that is quite significant. So we should not really have wrong expectations when it comes to the provision of such advice or consultations. You, you always need to know your own position and that of the other side, but that's what we learned anyway, the assessment of the situation. Now, an important point is, of course, how do you organize it? What ways and means can we find in order to render advice? to give advice. So it's probably not going to be always the same way. That will probably depend very much on the other side, where you have to deliver your advice. And one point that comes up time and again, a question that is raised often is, when can you be considered to have been successful? Are there criteria that determine about the success or failure of advice given? That's, of course, quite individual and depends on the expectations you had beforehand. And that's what I always ask myself, and that's what I would like to share with my speakers in a short reflection. So how do you see this based on your own experience, and what would you advise future consultants to do? This brings me to our speakers. It is really a pleasure to welcome Professor Schweftan. I have a very long CV. I'll make it short for you. You can read up on it. He was the director of the National Security Studies Center at the University of Haifa. And you were a consultant for 40 years at the highest political level. You provided advice not only in Israel, but also in the US, to the US Congress in particular. And you published on the subject of strategy consultation and thus also provided kind of advice and you also taught at the university. So from your CV I have identified three target groups, so three channels. One is the direct approach to advise politicians then through media and publications and the third way is through universities and the decision makers of the future. A quarter will come to you. I would like to introduce the panelists first, if I may. So there's somebody who doesn't need any introduction here is Brigadier Mosul Zobe. Everybody in Austria knows him, of course. I only took the last page of his CV. I think that'll make it easier. 
He always worked in the international arena, was the head of the Department of Military Policy. He was interim head of the Directorate for Security Policy. In Brussels, he worked in two capacities, the representative of Austria with the international organizations, and he, that's a distinction not only for you, but also for Austria, I would say, as the Director General of uh, the EU military staff. Today, he's allegedly retired, but as far as I know, he's very active. Retired, but not tired. Thank you, and a cordial welcome. Dear Wolfgang. From Albania, we'd like to welcome uh, Brigadier General Sander Leshai. Brigadier, you also have uh, a long standing expertise and a long career. You passed the military academy and you then became the commander of the military academy that you studied at. You also have a lot of international experience. You were defense attaché in Germany and adjoining countries. And since 2013, you've been a consultant for a national security advisor of the prime minister. And I think that you can also tell us about uh, your long suffering there. There's another CV that I've never seen before in this form. That's uh, General Major Jair Golan, from the platoon command all the way to the command of a division used all over the place, in the northern section, all the way to the deputy uh, chief of staff. So an incredible career. And you're also known, and you became famous, by a speech that you held in 2016, where I think at the political level, not everybody was very happy. But that caused a lot of, well, attention. And that's a form of indirect advice, to create attention and to Oh, well, speak your mind when you think it's the right time to do so. Thank you very much and welcome. And you have come from the farthest way, General Lieutenant Vinod Kandare <coughs> from India. So you also served all over the place. And you were also in the high mountains and you worked under extreme conditions where you were deployed at the borderline. Very difficult, very challenging. You also collected a lot of international experience during a UN deployment in 1993 in El Salvador. You're a highly decorated officer, and in your role as a director general of the military intelligence service and deputy chief of staff, you were often capable and required to provide information and advice whether you liked it or not. So we are very much looking forward to hearing your experiences. A courier welcome to your general. This brings me to the first speaker, but I have two short messages, a good one and a bad one. The good one is you have a highly interested audience. The bad news is you only have 10 minutes time. And this is why I prepared some little cards you have three minutes left, one minute left, and I'd like to ask you to respect this. I don't have a red card, but this isn't football after all. So, dear Professor, would you please take the floor? You have ten minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Let me start by saying that I've never been and I could never be a consultant that is part of a system. In other words, I've never been employed by the government or by the army or by any other government. What I've done, and for a very long time, I'm speaking about more than 45 years, I've been consulting people on the political uh, level, on the intelligence level, on the military level, for a very long time as an independent person who people call on in order to get an insider-outsider perspective. Insider in the sense that I'm privy to the information and I know 
what the issues are that people are discussing. Outsider in the sense that I'm never part of the system and what they want is a perspective that comes from a person who knows the issues but is not part of the system that is making the decisions. And I will very shortly say what it takes in order to get access to people, not the physical access that you can speak to them, but they will actually listen to you and there is the possibility that they will even consider what you are suggesting. And then I want to concentrate on the question of substance. What is the kind of advice that you can give that in the final analysis has effect on decisions that are made? Not that they ask you what should we do and then they do it, but listening to what you have to say on what they're about to do and suggesting a different perspective, very often making an impact on the final decision. What you need in order to get access, to be seriously considered, is first of all a kind of reputation that you accumulate over a long period of time. People who consult you will then consult you again if what you've said had anything to contribute to them. The second is the question of credibility. In other words, you have proven again and again and again that when you made a suggestion, when you made predictions, because these suggestions are always associated with predictions. If we do A, B will happen. If we will not do B, C will happen. And very often, the offer is not do something, but don't do something. You have the urge to do something, don't do it. To give only one example that comes to mind immediately, there is a civil war in Syria. It looks as if it's a great opportunity for Israel. The best thing you can do is nothing. In other words, not become involved in a civil war. To tell people not to, what not to do is not less important very often than suggesting what they should do. The third element is discretion, and I cannot overemphasize this element. You're speaking to people who are in a political situation, in a political environment, and they're very, very sensitive about their own position. If you're not absolutely discreet, 100% discreet, then A, the only people who will take your advice will be of one political camp, and then people of the other political camp will not even consider it. And even in the same political camp, people are rivals. They're in politics. That, this is what it's all about. And if anything ever leaks, you're done. And therefore, never speak to a decision maker when there is more than one person in the room outside of you. If others come and there is a group, be very polite, let them speak, say nothing. Because wherever there are more than two people, it will leak. And if it leaks, it completely loses every effect, and maybe you will have a specific effect on one decision, but then you will never have an effect on decisions again. And by the way, your commitment to discretion does not end when the person dies. Because even when he is dead, the others want to know that your secret is, worth, is, is safe with them. And they will not let you into their considerations unless they know that it will never, under any circumstances, leak, either when they are alive or later, because others are looking. The fourth is find out what your relative advantage is. Because if you start giving advice where you think you have something very smart to say, but you don't have a relative adva advantage, better shut up. Let me give you what I believe to be my advantage, or people who come from my side of the um, events have an advantage on. When you're not in a position of responsibility, you can afford to discuss what is important. Most people who are responsible for something need to deal with what is urgent. It takes about 80% of their time. By the way, this is not a criticism. They don't have any choice because if they don't deal with what is urgent, everything will fall apart. So what you need is to constantly focus on issues that are less important because they are more urgent. When you're outside the system and you don't have the responsibility, 
then you can focus on what you think is important. You may be wrong, but at least you have the opportunity to look at it, and it's a different perspective, and the people who deal with the urgent issues will be interested in what you have to say. The next is timing. Don't come to people when you have a good idea. Come to people when they're open to listen to it. And usually it happens when the paradigm that this person has been following for a very long time reaches a dead end. Then they're vulnerable. They're out of ideas. They're looking for new ideas. This is your time to come in and to say what you have to say because they're open for it and this is much more important. And when you present your ideas, make sure that they are sure that it was their idea. I mean, when I, the best successes I had is when somebody calls me and he says, you know, I had a brilliant idea and this is exactly what I talked to him two weeks earlier. And the moment it's his idea, then you've really succeeded. Never take credit for a good idea. Always give credit for a good idea for a person who, who you want to influence. And the last element is independence. Never get paid. Never get any benefits. You can be independent so that you can come to a person and if he asks you, what do you think of my brilliant idea, you can say it is idiotic. If you cannot say to him that this is an idiotic idea, don't do it. Let me come to the substance. And I would say that the most important contribution that you can make if you come from outside the system is to identify the center of gravity to ask the real question, to ask the question that matters in the long run. Since I don't want to give a long historical perspective here, let me take things that I've been involved with recently, and they're not the most important, but perhaps the most recent. In 2005, Israel unilaterally disengaged from the Gaza Strip. What was the immediate concern that most people had in mind? Will it make terrorism rise higher or go lower? And I said, I don't care. If terrorism is five times the size than before, this is not the issue that we should concern. The only thing that I'm asking myself is, is the Israeli society stronger without Gaza or with Gaza? The most important asset that Israel has is the support of the people of Israel. The strength of the Israeli society is the only thing Israel cannot do without. It can do without American support. Very, very difficult, but it can do. It can do without European criticism. It will be very difficult, but I think we somehow will survive it. But the one thing Israel cannot do without is the strength of the Israeli society. And when this is achieved, the rest is, doesn't really matter. Another example, we had a confrontation in the Gaza Strip four years ago. And the question was, will we defeat Hamas or not defeat Hamas? This is negligible. It doesn't really matter. There was only one issue, and this is, will it strengthen the relationship with Egypt? The relationship with Egypt is important. And when we pursued the Gaza confrontation four years ago, we even disregarded the United States because it was Obama who didn't understand anything about the Middle East and never learned. This was John Kerry who, who came there to support Hamas with Turkey and with Qatar. But from an Israeli point of view, the military issue was not very important. The confrontation with Hamas was not important. If Israel has, as it does, intimate relations with Egypt very, very, very close, then the Gaza question becomes negligible. There is the issue of public legitimacy. You cannot possibly, in a democratic country, when we are speaking not of a single war, Israel is in war for 140 years. It is only eruptions that come and go, but the war is there. If you don't have public legitimacy, you have lost the war, regardless of what happens in the war itself. Take again the Israeli example of 1982 in Lebanon. We kicked Arafat out, but the Israeli society was torn and polarized. And because it was torn and polarized, it was a mistake, because you need to focus on public legitimacy. And the last thing I can um, characterize by using a term that I think in this 
uh, public will be understood if I bring it in the, in the original, and this is the Große Zusammenhänge. Namely, to point at what really counts. If I were Truman's advisor in 1945, I would tell him, drop the bomb on Hiroshima and then the one on Nagasaki, regardless of what happens with Japan. You have to tell Stalin, you will have very soon a nuclear bomb and I want to show you what we can do because the fact that we are nice people doesn't mean that we will be less brutal if it comes to the real story, namely the Cold War after uh, Japan. If I were, God forbid, the advisor to Trump today, I would tell him I don't very much care about a single decision that you make here and there. The important thing is that you demonstrate that you are willing to change the rules of the game. Because you don't come to a place when the United States and you say, what are the rules I will play? You say, I am the United States, the rules are those that make me win, and I will show you how. This is the Große Zusammenhänge. I had a few more examples, but I'm trying to be civilized. Thank you. Sehr geehrter Herr Professor, herzlich Herr Professor, thank you very much for this very structured presentation where many people took notes and nodded agreement. I think that you spoke from the bottom of many people's heart here. Mr. Brigadier Vosel-Soviet. Thank you, Brigadier. Walter. What I would like to present to you today is the attempt at making a systematic assessment strategy consulting at the interface to the political decision-making level. So, first of all, we need to talk about the intersection we are talking about. What about the contents of uh, strategic consulting and, based on my specific experience, what does this look like when it comes to a strategic system of the European Union? You can take a look at many different intersections, and these differ by whether we're talking about states or about multinational organizations. So depending on what we're talking about, the intersection would be, well, how we advise politicians may differ a lot. The group of strategic advisors and the contents they're trying to convey are subject to a very rapid change and development. <clears throat> now, the questions related to security and defense, and that's what I'd like to focus on in my presentation. As we all see, when it comes to the overall topic of this conference, are more and more diverse. And increasingly, they also cover non-military aspects in order to make the military aspects more effective. So that is something that is always subject to change, and this is something that our strategic advisors and consultants, and I'm always going to talk about the highest level of strategy consulting, we have to prepare them for that eventuality. So we're not only looking at a large number of different functions that we need to fulfill, but also the increasingly complex interconnection of the various aspects of security. So essentially, a few years ago, or maybe even a few decades ago, it was quite clear that there was external security, internal security. So these were two separate fields. But today, this is no longer the case. For every European state and for the European Union as a whole, for example, the terrorist threat is something that crosses these boundaries. And this also applies to cyber threats and organized crime. So the supreme strategic advisors, or the group of the top most strategic advisors, have to include these factors in their <coughs> deliberations.
Of course, based on my personal experience, I will talk primarily about the military tools. But these factors, of course, need to be considered. The description of the interface. Well, we have the state, within states, multinational, there's the diversity of content. So the question that needs to be asked is, is this a homogeneous structure? Or maybe the interface of the political and military dimensions change depending on what the political interest is all about. Let's say in a given command situation for an operation, it could be the case that only a very general level of information is available to the topmost political decision-making level. And on account of a political event, all of a sudden there is an interest on shedding a closer light on some of these issues. And then, of course, the interface, the intersection will change. And then we have to talk about, well, a, an area of overlap and not just an interface. And then, of course, there is a difference between individual states and in between individual organizations. There are completely different intersections depending on how fast the decision-making processes occur in this organization or state in question. If these decision-making processes occur very quickly in a very homogeneous way, then the interface and the advice will work differently than in states where there is much more complex and much more multi-layered approach when it comes to decision-making. Here in Europe, I have two examples. On the one hand, there's France, where this interface is actually the chief of staff and the chief of the general staff. And there's Germany, where this interface is much more complex. The parliament needs to be involved. The federal government needs to be involved. So all of these are things that, well, don't happen like that in France, or maybe ex post, after the fact. So that changes uh, the responsibility of the advisor in a decisive way. Talking about responsibility, I would also like to talk about the nature of what on the one hand, and well, ha what happens on one hand and what happens at the other end of this interface. So these are two different worlds when it comes to the military and the political level. The military is trained differently, speaks differently, communicates differently. Politicians pursue objectives that, to the military, can often only be understood after close analysis. We should be able to assume that both sides have one thing in common, namely the meta-objective. That is to say, to develop our armed forces in a meaningful way and to carry out operations to make sure that they are in the interest of the whole or the state. If that isn't the case, then we need to work towards that. And that is one of the most important tasks of consultants and advisors. Now let me briefly refer to the international organizations. There it is especially difficult to define the interface because we have at least two of them. There is one interface within EU, NATO and other international organizations as far as Europe is concerned. And then we need to also link up with the capitals of European countries where the question is asked, is this in line with our interests? And there's another loop of advice given there. So we have uh, two interfaces, the politics, military, and the various levels. So I would like to briefly talk about where this happens in the European Union, for your information. So the first line of the interface for an organization. 
So as far as I know, that's in the Political and Security Committee, but we have to be aware that this isn't the first interface. Complex questions in international organizations, and that's the same for NATO, are not discussed in this larger group of 28, but in a smaller group, a much smaller group, that needs to fulfill two criteria. They have a strong interest in the question, and they're capable to contribute to solving the question. Now, once they have agreed in this smaller group, then the 28 discuss it. And this brings us back to what we already discussed before. So there's one layer in Brussels and a deeper layer in the various capitals of Europe. And another item of information, what plays a decisive role in providing strategic advice in both organizations. That's the understanding that exists between the various military advisors, the military representatives in general, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the ambassadors assigned to them. If the language spoken there is right, if the understanding between those people is right, then the contents are right as well, and then the results will be right too. That isn't always the case. And then it is incumbent on the capital, the chief of staff, chief of general staff in his environment, his entourage, who have to process that further. Now, the last point, therefore, focuses on what's decisive, in my mind, in strategic advice, is to have a common understanding. First, you need to find a common language. And in the following, it's also a common understanding of the goals or the meta-objectives to be pursued. What is it that we want to achieve? So this is where we need to reach agreement. This is still an open discussion as to whether, when it comes to such questions, it is more suitable to establish a direct contact that is to say, a traditional example, chief of general staff and a minister or the head of state, or, as it is increasingly practiced due to the high level of complexity of the questions asked, maybe there should be an interposed group of advisors, so the general chief of staff doesn't talk to his boss anymore, but he talks to this group of advisors. This can be advantageous if, for example, at the level of a ministry, military and non-military functions are, well, represented at the same time in the framework of national defense, then it can be done that way. Otherwise, it is, well, preference is to be given to direct contact. Thank you, Brigadier. I believe what has been shown not quite well that there is a big difference whether this is being done on a multinational or national level or within the framework of an international organization. I found it also very interesting indeed that you also addressed the responsibility of the consultant in various situations and how it has changed over time. And this is very important that we understand each other, speak the same languages, and have the same ideas about our object objectives. This must be clear at the beginning of each process, because otherwise you might actually err on either side of the path. Uh, Brigadier General, I would like to ask you now to report on your Albanian experiences. You have gone a very special uh, path, down a very special path indeed in recent years. Feel, thank you very much. Good morning. I'm going to try to speak in German because 24 years ago I actually learned German here and I spoke my very first German words here at this very place. So I'm going to try. So maybe 
um, I will not um, go follow the guidelines. I will speak more about the Albanian context to highlight the situation. Albania is a small country. It's a very old, very, very old nation, but a tiny country. And since the Great Schism of 1054 to joining NATO in 2009, Albania was sitting on one of the most important borders in the world and survived for almost 1,000 years on this position. This was the border that separated the West from Byzantium uh, and uh, <coughs> So Albania was always there at the border for over almost 1,000 years, um, the border separating the Ottoman Empire from the West. And uh, then the finally the border between the West and the Communist Empire. So almost 1,000 years we've been sitting on the border. And the fight for the existence at the most important border in the world has determined the history and culture and development of our countries. Archaeological traces show two uh, different pictures. Early times had, saw a high culture, theater, churches, towns, art. Second period actually is manifest by after the Great Schism, we have uh, castles, fortifications, mosques, heavy walls, and many bunkers. Today, we have reached a third uh, era since joining NATO. We are no longer on the border of the world. And this has changed the strategic context for our country totally. Life on the border, on the periphery of West and East, the lack of ethnic and language connections with the neighbors, and bitter historical experience have created a strategic culture, contributed to a strategic culture that was characterized by mistrust and isolation. At the time of the communist dictatorship, uh, the turn the country turned into a model boy of international isolation. I'm going to quote now um, um, from the strategic document, the most important strategic document from 1985 in the uh, communist time. Quote, the aggressive NATO alliance and the Warsaw Pact group seemed the two most dangerous enemies of our country. Uh, to enforce their aggressive plans of our country, they might separately or together attack our country. This was the strategic context in which Albania tried to survive. Uh, fighting against uh, the Warsaw Pact and NATO. And of course, this uh, conditioned us and uh, uh, has had um, great influence on the culture. Since the joining NATO in 2009, the situation has totally changed. Instead of isolation and paranoia, we are part of a large alliance, and we are trying to actually uh, follow a different path by openness and to achieve our strategic goals in this way. As a small country, as a small country of course, we like to believe in the story of David and Goliath, and uh, also our strategic theories build on this <coughs> uh, view. According to a study by Arjun Roft, in over 200 years, from 1800 to 1998, the uh, weaker actors in an uneven conflict uh, and where there was an asymmetry relationship of larger than 5 to 1, 1 in 29.2 percent of cases. But the chance to win of the weaker actors when looked at in more detail, show up a very interesting trend indeed in the first period of the study from 1800 to 1849, the weaker actors won 11.8 percent of all conflicts. In the second period, from 1815 to 1899, 
they won 20.5 percent of all conflicts. And in the third period, 1900 to 1949, they won 34.9 percent of the conflicts. And in the final phase of the study, 1950 to 1998, the weaker parties to a conflict won in 55 percent of the cases against the stronger actors. And the question now is, is this an anomaly or not? I have no answer to this question, but this is the way it is. But. Um, this is a pretty credible study that these data are out from. What I would like, what I wanted to show by telling you this is also the weaker actors have theoretically a chance to assert themselves, and we as Albania are one of the weakest players. And um, it seems to be that if all factors or taken into consideration all the physical factors, all the measurable and quantifiable factors, um, how do I create power, uh, how do I use technology, and so on. There seems to be such an anomaly, and this is the answer, why the smaller parties have a chance. So it's not the measurable and quantifiable factors that make the difference, but it is the non-measurable, the non-quantifiable factors uh, that um, have to do a lot with strategy and politics. And I see the role of strategists and of consultants in this um, area as well. Uh, they have a chance. In view of uh, these connections in Albania, uh, we have now mm, done the following in Albania since joining NADO. Um, and um, <coughs> the, uh, to actually also align our, the, our considerations, main considerations uh, are taking us away from isolation, to more openness and cooperation, and our national strategy that uh, we was passed in 2014 is characterized by the thought that more chances exist, uh, more than risks, uh, with this new orientation of openness. Um, either we uh, react to dangers and risks that are found to be everywhere, or we try to use chances. And um, our approach is rather to go for the chances actively. And I would like to give you a few examples what this means. Um, should, if we look at all the risks and dangers that Serbia has been posing for our country, uh, then uh, we have to look at what we can do. <coughs> or shouldn't we rather go for <coughs> uh, something else, uh, build up a perspective that's different? We were looking more for um, options and possibilities and not so much just reacting to risks and dangers. The first, the first visit of a uh, Albanian prime minister to Serbia, we started a historical dialogue with Serbia after over 70 years of no contacts whatsoever on a higher political level. And today, uh, it's all different. The climate between the two countries is very different from uh, the times before, although uh, the improve the relations could still be improved. Um, um, especially, and of course, uh, Serbia is a very special case in point, and there are many challenges. The same approach we tried with Macedonia and with Greece. Um, we are trying to um, strengthen our 
ties with Greece um, and to uh, do away with the ghosts of the past going back to World War II. There is a martial law that's still valid, um, and this really needs to be done away with. And now I'm getting to your question, Brigadier. She, she, you put some specific questions to us. And I would like to briefly comment here. First question was personal understanding of consultancy. And I'm going to briefly sketch my position here. I would like to say that we know as consultants, we advise the power players. And um, of course, uh, no power claim must be on the side of the consultant, because otherwise you end up creating bizarre tensions. Uh, what is important for me is to learn more. Um, I'm no longer an apprentice. Um, and when I was studying here, I learned all this. Um, I learned here that there is a lot more to it than what appears to be the case. Uh, it is important that the perspective, um, and this is something that I've learned, um, it's um, uh, the perspective matters. You have to uh, actually um, uh, play from behind. It's important to understand that there are competitive areas, and security is just one of them. And therefore, it is important to understand there are also other important areas, and not just the one you are working in. And at the end, I'd like to maybe disagree with Professor Schufton or say something different, rather. He said, don't give advice that is not asked for. Well, uh, don't stay in the questioning mode. mode. Um, this is connected with politics, strategic culture in a country like Albania, if you only wait until people ask questions, you will never get asked. So it's important to take into account the strategic culture or the culture of a country. And if you want to change things, you have to ask questions in Albania. Um, um, this, I think, has to do with a number of factors. As I said, the cultural um, uh, tradition and also the individual person and their background, um, you have to take into account who is the person uh, that you are consulting. You will ha sometimes need to be a little bit provocative. Thank you very much. Dear Brigadier, thank you very much for your deliberations. I think you have given us an example of a strategic decision at the top level, namely how to come up with an overall strategy, how to support it and implement it. I believe this is the crowning of any strategic advisor if he's put in such a situation. And you have given us such an example, and I'm also very pleased that you hold a different view of Professor Schweftan. This ensures for a lively debate in the following. General, please. Ladies and gentlemen, well, let me start first uh, to say to my Albanian friend that we have great affection to small ancient people. <laughs> so we have a lot to discuss. Okay. Um, I would like to start after 30 years of service uh, with a confession. You don't mind. Uh, what is the confession? Yes, here and there along my career, after meeting the political echelon, we used to chat, you know, we generals, between ourselves and saying, ah, they understand nothing, they don't really explore the subject, they ignore every, you know, inconvenient considerations, and things like that. Uh, we were wrong. Why we were wrong? Well, 
First of all, it's not very productive, but in a way it's a bit stupid. Because the question for the military echelon is how to enhance, how to facilitate good discussion with the political echelons. Otherwise, what you get? Almost nothing. Uh, let me talk about three typical malfunctions. The first one is misunderstanding. The second one is about unnecessary presumptions. And the third one is about averting responsibility. All right? It's a good deal for, you know, noontime. Um, let's start with the first one. Um, at least once a year, we approach the political echelon with our uh, operative plans uh, in order to confirm them. Uh, what we used to do is to take the most severe but still reasonable scenario, making a plan for that, and demanding, of course, the resources in order to support the preparations. Makes sense. In most cases, I would say almost all cases, uh, the political echelon confirmed the plan. But the minute we get out of the room, we understand totally different things. And let me describe that. We understand that the political echelon really accepts the scenario as the most important one. And secondly, yes, we have an expectation to get the budget in order to support the preparation. What the political echelon understands is something completely different. We confirm just one scenario of many, not necessarily the most important one. And secondly, money? What is the connection to that? Nothing. Uh, the second issue. The second issue is about unnecessary presumption. We think in the military that we are very wise. And we know from the media, from formal discussions with the political echelon, that we understand the very basic consideration of the political echelon. So we shape our plans according to our understanding. But very rarely, we approach the political echelons and tell them, look, before we start the planning process, please let me know what are your presumptions. What do you really mean? Not what you say to the public. What are your real intentions? And then what is happening? We approach the political echelons with certain plans, certain operations, which are not well connected to their desires, to their willingness to take risks. And this is wrong. And the third issue is averting responsibility. We should notice that on the friction, between strategic, military strategic level and political level or political strategic level, well, there is a kind of an overlapping by nature. It's very hard to define what is the clear cut between the two. And in some cases, we exploit this vague boundaries in a way that take the responsibility out of our shoulders and put them unnecessarily on the political soldiers. Let me give you an example for that. We used to say that the main failure of the Yom Kippur War was the conception that avoid Israel from understanding the intelligence that was gathered along the years. Well, that's true, but this is not enough. 
They were in the very first three days of the war. Terrible military professional problems. And if you don't understand that here the main problem is yours, because it's your responsibility, because it belongs to the operational level. And if you rely on the political echelon because he is responsible for another problem, then you do something which is completely unprofessional and could hamper you know, further preparation for future war. All right, so these are the problems. What to do with that? I would say four things. First thing is to have open, free discussions with the, military, with the political echelons. But this is really trivial, and no one knows how to do that. Uh, so I try to say something which is more, more meaningful. First, take responsibility for the discourse. Take responsibility for that. Although you are the inferior, not the superior. We are at the, strategic le at the military strategic level. We, are, we have the position to initiate discussions. And one of the, the most important tasks of the chief of staff is to facilitate these discussions with the political echelons. Second thing, always come with alternatives, with options. It's wrong to approach the political echelon with one option, because it's narrowed the discussion instead of expanding that. And third thing is take full responsibility on your decisions and actions and define and redefine over and over again, in any instance, what are the exact boundaries between the political echelons and the military echelons, and these boundaries are moving all the time, and they are not the same. And seven minutes, yeah? Three. Thank you very much. Three. General, thank you so much on your precise um, Three minutes, you have three minutes remaining afterwards. Three minutes for you know, the next session. Okay. Kind of <laughs> Ex excellent. Vielen Dank auch, dass Sie auf ganz klare Punkte. Thank you so much for being so clear and ref uh, pointing out really important points. Understanding each other, this is so important. The language plays an important role. Taking on the responsibility, you stress that too. And also the interplay between politics and military on the highest strategic level. Thank you so much. I can imagine that there will be quite a few questions um, from our audience. Oh, no, sorry. There is another speaker. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to be amongst you. India is way far off, and I think I may be one of the first Indians to be talking to you. Uh, the topic is extremely contemporary. I will be talking in terms of the Indian context because that has certain things which are uniquely different uh, from Austria or from Europe as such. Quite a few things are common to what has been explained by the general from the Israel Defense Force. I am not going to repeat them, but let me tell you, when we look at being a consultant and the practitioners being at the helm of affairs at advising the apex body, we have to understand it's not a military problem that we are talking of. It's a comprehensive national security that we are talking of. So a political leader with his different background is not adept at understanding the military language, the military jargon, 
the military connotations so we have to simplify it we have to make the political leader understand and give him sound advice gives him the pros and cons of what it implies the result that will happen and if it does not happen the implications because for the political leader the results are most important his job is not permanent so he is worried or she is worried about the implications of the decision taken based on what the consultant has said in our part of the world we have three people who are stakeholders one is the political leader we have a bureaucracy which is one of the best in the country but they also have nothing to do with the military training quite unlike your countries where you have a system of conscription where everyone would have gone through at least the fundamental military training our bureaucrats have no idea our political leaders have no idea which makes the job of the military leaders and consultants much more complicated and complex however the satisfaction is derived when you achieve results coming out of a complex situation so that is where the consultants have to be more mature consultants have to be more involved there are various ministries in a government there are vert various verticals in a government which do not talk to each other or at least they talk to each other but superficially it is the consultant who will be successful if he interacts with these different ministries and makes the verticals talk to each other for every such interaction it cannot be based on formal orders there is a lot that happens behind the scene and that is what should happen when a consultant is doing his job there would be various consultants in various ministries you have to network similarly abroad when as a consultant i have to interact with my counterparts abroad i must have a working relationship and a kind of confidence based on which i can give the best possible inputs to my minister and tell him or her that look you can go ahead there is an understanding on the other side you can go ahead please do it there is no written assurance that can be given but the level of confidence that the consultants amongst themselves have it will happen the the kind of conviction with which you speak to the political leaders and the reputation that you carry will either win the day or your advice may or may not be taken uh, very briefly i want to give two examples as you all would know possibly that in 1971 we had one of the biggest military victories i do not want to say it was a military victory i would say it was a national victory when we went to a 13 day war and bangladesh was formed on our eastern flank it was a strategy of the government and the strategy of the government was to create our eastern flank with a different state the chief of the army staff general manikshaw who was later on conferred with the title of field marshal he advised the prime minister that it has to be a short war and the short war was considering the environment around in those days of the 70s we had no support from any other country except the soviet union and we did not want to become the center of world war 3 with the us and the others intervening and china intervening from the north so the decision the advice as given by the chief was to have a short war 13 days and that was over there were various other issues which were explained including one that we needed time to be ready and during that particular time it was pakistan which gave us a chance and we were able to settle the war once for all on the eastern flank that was an all out war the advice was for an all out war
However, in 1999, when Pakistan caused aggression on the icy heights of Kargil, that is the Himalayas, the advice this time by the Chief of Army Staff was to keep it limited, to keep it a limited war. The reason was very clear. In 1998, India had done nuclear test and India had put on a, had been put on a number of sanctions. We did not have resources. So the ideal situation was to keep the war a limited war and that is exactly what was done. The emphasis is correct advice in the correct format would win the day. As consultants, one of the best advice somebody gave to me, don't be a confrontationist, collaborate with the political leader, advise him, cooperate with him, you will have the best solution for the nation. Ultimately, what we have to always keep reminding us ourselves, be a nationalist, put the interest of the country first, don't flaunt your position and don't show as if you are the one who are pulling the shots, be in the background and the country will benefit. Thank you. Uh, General, thank you very much uh, for these examples and for sharing your experience with us. I don't think there is a more dramatic way to point out how important it is to have the military expertise on one hand and to have all the capabilities and capacities and knowing about the limits of your resources and capacities and on the other hand to have the political understanding on the possibilities of, poli of politics and what you can do and contribute in critical situations. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have 10 minutes now for discussion. They are all yours. I am uh, uh, will take the first three questions. Generals, please also state your names and use a microphone. <coughs> Uh, you that advisors must be discreet, they should never reveal what they said and so forth. But there's another aspect. The other aspect is they are also advisors within the system. And as you know, uh, that was translated into your language here, that we have this general staff system where the Führergehilfe, the general staff officer, has to give advice. Also, and the commander has to listen to him. And this is why we stressed yesterday, the day before yesterday, and, and that comes too short, that he who gives advice so is responsible for his advice. That must be highly stressed. And we all made the mistake for a long time, also in Germany, to say, well, we gave advice, but the politicians have made this or this decision. That's absolutely wrong. We cannot do this. And that is just you escape because you escape from responsibility if you do this. And to my Israeli friend, generally speaking, I think, and we, we always, I always did this in my publications, we have a German term, grundsätzlich. Generally, a decision-making process must be, must be run at every level of political, strategic, military, strategic, and so forth. That can be, that there could be, can be differences in war, in under time pressure, and so forth. Because the planning horizons are different and the, the expertise at these various levels is different. And this is why I agree with you also, but we must have decision-making processes at every level possible, if possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for this Anmerkung. I think it was more a question than a comment. It was not so much a question, but a comment. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the middle aisle. Uh, Colonel Rosenitz, thank you. I'd like to ask a question, question to General Leship. We know each other and uh, we met in Albania and had talks. Um, Albania now is actually waiting at the gate of the EU. If we look at the overall development with migration and Islamophobia in some areas, 
uh, Albania is, of course, first looked at as a um, Islamist country and the first one that wants to join the EU. Is this my question? This is my question. Is this a political dimension that you have to deal with, where you can do something, where you prepare the politicians that there may be a and especially the the citizens of these countries um, uh, who want to do business with Albania um, and they want to actually it's in their interest that Albania does not join the EU uh, and then I have another question general I have a question to you um, the members of the EU, you were talking about military uh, counseling and the mood, and um, this deals uh, with the European leadership in the European Union. The military tasks would be the core business, our core business, and um, would actually have to be done in a certain way so that it can be effective on the top levels. And so um, the permanent representatives for certain topics actually have a uh, focus on foreign policy topics. Do you think it would make sense with the permanent um, committee uh, should deal uh, with this in the European Union? We take another question. Poland, uh, two short questions. My first question to uh, our professor, first speaker. Mm, it was very interesting. We have very interesting conference about the strategy. I would like to ask you about the strategy for your region, uh, what you explained. We have, last time, two strategies. The first strategy, I mean Israel, Iran. First strategy, of course, is a Trump strategy, American strategy, which is, of course, very interesting and with big impact, not only for Israel and for Iran, also for Europe. And the second strategy, of course, is European strategy or some European country strategy, like Germany, like France, like Great Britain. What is your advice? as a neutral advisor to European Union, what to do? What should be nowadays European strategy in confrontation of very difficult new strategy of United States, I mean, for Europe? And my second question to our uh, Indian general, thank you very much for your presence. I am interested, uh, especially because I am professor in Jagiellonia University, and my branch now is uh, exactly India, China, and much more. The same question, strategy, because your country is uh, huge with new power, new power and new rule, not only a regional rule, but very generally also more and more important. What, from your perspective, from Indian perspective, what is what we should expect? I mean, new strategy of India, because from one side, you are very close to the United States. From the other side, you cooperate, I mean, economy uh, with uh, China, and uh, China is your big partner also. And of course, we observe two strategies, United States from one side, and from the other side, I mean, Asia, and from the other side, of course, uh, China. What is future of India? I mean, the strategy for next 15, 20, 25 years in Asia and not only in Asia. Thank you so much. Uh, the Albanian question first, uh, Albania into the EU. Thank you so much for this question. Uh, actually, it's a pity that there are these perceptions in Europe. Uh, everybody, Albania, is described as an, is a con an Islamist country. That's totally untrue. This, we are not an Islamist country. We are a country. 
where there are three large religions that living peacefully side by side. And we have to say that the majority of the Albanians are not uh, following Islam, not of the Islamic faith. Although this fact is known, Albania is still uh, called a Muslim country. And uh, from this perspective, of course, um, uh, political decisions are also influenced in Europe. Albania is one of the first Christian countries. It was one of the first countries that was Christianized by the Apostle Paul. So, um, although the Ottoman Empire, of course, left traces and um, uh, many people had to convert to Islam under the Ottoman Empire. But why did they do this? Um, and this is something we could discuss because they were Catholic. And for the Orthodox Church, the Ottoman uh, Empire had a concord that, in the sense that they would allow them to keep their religion. And this is why the Albanians had to convert. They were forced to convert. And still, Albania is a country where all religions are represented, and the majority of the population are not Muslim. So this is a fact that Europe apparently doesn't know. Um, um, I don't know how this uh, view of Albania came. It's the country of Mother Teresa. It's a country where last year 38 Catholic priests were um, actually uh, elevated to and blessed by the Pope uh, on in one session. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, can only happen in a country where there are a lot of Catholics. Uh, and this is the truth. So forgive me if I'm getting emotional now. And um, so we have these priests that were beatified. And it is um, a big mistake to actually call a Catholic country a Muslim country. This, strategically speaking, is a great error. And it altogether, Europe tries to become um, smaller um, and by moving together. And so I don't think this is politically correct to call Albania a Muslim country. We always say that European culture is based on Christian, Greek, Roman, Judaic roots. And with these roots, we also have them. These roots are all actually outside, almost all of them outside the EU. Nine of 10. Uh, Roman cities are outside of uh, the EU territory. Only, only Rome is the only large city of the Roman Empire that is within the EU now. And instead of going back to the roots, um, and by this I mean to expand accordingly, Europe is trying to isolate itself and become smaller. And this is a great error in my mistake, in my opinion. So uh, we have no other alternative, I hear of, in, but we in Albania, sorry, we have no other alternative but to join the West. Because culturally and in, in all other respects, we belong to Europe. The question remains whether we will be in a position to change this perception on our religion and um, um, correct it. It does not correspond to facts. Thank you. Brigadier, thank you very much. I think you uh, have made a substantial contribution to correct this picture. And I can only support this from my personal perceptions in Albania, in your country. Brigadier, finally, a military advisory council, um, so that this is not being discussed solely in the foreign policy um, committee. Well, I can't really answer this so directly because nobody can say whether a committee for defense is the best solution. What is clear, however, is the dynamics of the past two years have shown that we need to make changes, that we need to change the political military interface in the EU and especially the political leadership system. Uh, but in, to do this, uh, we need to clarify a few questions first. How far, fast do we want to do this? 
What do we want to decide on first? There are two strands in the EU, the large area of uh, uh, de developing a joint defense um, uh, culture, and the other one is the actual operations. And the urgency of the speed is especially on the operation side. Um, um, the same structure. Probably this means that we'll have the same structures because the operations are actually uh, decided on in the council and in the external service. And the defense uh, organization questions and the capabilities are moving in the direction of the commission. Now, how do we want to do this? What will happen in the commission? I'm just uh, asking questions at this point. Will they in the commission develop their own structure for this and organization? for this. We have seen in recent days that there is a proposal uh, for a defense secretary in the commission and that those two commissioners should actually act together uh, who have been dealing with these questions most. This is all in flux. The question remains, well, on the table, and this question has to be um, approached uh, dynamically because things are moving very fast in the European Union on this front. Thank you. General, India in the next 20 years, what would you tell us? <clears throat> As I understand, uh, let me explain to you the strategy obviously is next 20 years, 50 years. Strategy is not for next five years because next five years are only elections. So we have to look at strategy for next 20 years, 50 years. There is a lot of competition that has been generated with our northern neighbor China. So we have to look at the strategy of China also. So we know where is China going by 2025? We know where is China going by 2050. Our strategy gives out our policies and very clearly our policies are our own. They are not dictated and they are not pressurized by anybody. The United States of America suddenly one day felt that India has to become its pivot in Asia. He said no. India will be on its own. So India engages well with United States. India engages well with Russia. India engages extremely well with each country on its own. When we look at China, we took a stand and we said Belt Road Initiative, we are not going to be a part of it. It's a principled stand because to our west, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor goes through the area of Kashmir, which is legally ours. So therefore, we have said we will not be a part of the initiative for which most of the countries of the world are taking part in that Belt Road Initiative, not India. What I want to emphasize is India takes its own decisions irrespective of what is lured, what is given as money or whatever is the pressure. India does not come under pressure and India is known for that. What is our strategy? Our strategy is we will not get drawn into unnecessary conflicts and waste our resources, but militarily we will be strong enough to be a deterrent externally. Internally we have to consolidate being a democracy and being a pluralistic society with lots of differences of religion, language, race, we have our own internal challenges, but our internal challenges are to be handled by us. We react very strongly when our internal challenges are exploited by our neighbors in terms of religion. There, we, there is no tolerance in that particular area. So we look at our own strategy in terms of economy, a strong military for deterrence, a lot of advancement in science and technology, especially space, cyber also, and we also look at a strong health sector and education sector. That in itself is a strategy. Yep. 
Herzlichen Dank, Herr General, für diese Thank you, General, for this clarification. We have uh, time for three short comments from General Golan and a short comment by, and then we will have to conclude. There was a remark about uh, Iran and the strategy, the right strategy concerning Iran. And in my mind, it's a very clear issue. Um, Iran, by saying, threaten Israel all the time. We do not do, do you know, the opposite. It's that we have no intention to threaten Iran uh, as an Israeli initiative, just as a, as a response to Iranian threat. So we are more than 1,000 kilometers west of Iran, and we don't see any reason for direct confrontation between the two countries. This is not their understanding. They promise us to annihilate us uh, from the earth over and over and over again. We cannot ignore it. By our you know, experience, we cannot ignore it. Uh, the second issue is Iranian uh, activity. The Iranian activity in Syria is since 2014 is constantly against Israel. In 2014 and the beginning of 2015, we took down three different organizations made by Qasem Slimani in order to attack, to go, in order to launch terror attack on the Israeli borders. So this is a serious issue. What we see in Iran, in Syria, in the last few weeks, it's a constant uh, effort of Iran to build an infrastructure against Israel. This is not an illusion. This is a well-documented issue with a very strong, solid intelligence. So there is no place to be gentle with Iran. We have to be tough with them because from our experience, I think also from your experience, there is no other way. You cannot convince them by be polite. The second issue is that um, I, I, back, I go back to the relationship with the political echelon. Uh, you need to define at the very start of every discussion with the political echelon, what is the self-confidence, the level of self-confidence of your counterpart. If you lack a self-confidence on a certain issue, your job is relatively easy. If he has a lot of self-confidence, you are going to work very hard if you think differently. Yes. So you need to define that, you know, and prepare for that. And the third, and the third thing is, well, personally, I don't like the term uh, advising. Advise. To, to provide advice, uh, advices, it's for people who are outside the system. I acknowledge that. But if you are inside the system, you need discussions, not advices. Perfect. Thank you. Professor Schechter. Let me first respond to the remark that you've made here. Uh, politics is the blame game and the credit game. And the political echelon, particularly the, on the top level, want to take credit for things that succeeded and want to put the blame on somebody else when it fails. And therefore, when you're inside the system, you're part of this game because you're part of the system. Because if something succeeds, then the decision maker wants to take credit. If something did not succeed, then the people who gave another advice will leak to the press that they gave you another advice, and therefore they will want to get the credit of having been in a position of trying to prevent this uh, uh, misaction uh, from taking place. So in the final decision, the decision maker is very careful about what he gets from inside the system because what he will be criticized for anyway is not having an orderly system of decision making. So what a smart political leader does is 
he first of all makes up his mind, then he has a system of orderly that he doesn't take seriously, and then he can make up his mind by consulting people inside the system and outside the system that he trusts. But it all focuses on the personal trust of, of this person and it has to do with discretion. Concerning what kind of advice would I give the Europeans vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Understand that you are not a power. Please understand, Europe is not a power comparable to the United States. Europe cannot have an independent strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. It is too serious to leave it in the hands of the Europeans. So, can you affect the American decision by doing this or that? Yes. Can you have an independent decision that will stand in the long run in the way of an American decision? No. And I think the Europeans take themselves too seriously because they believe that if they have a foreign affairs ministry or whatever they call uh, this structure, they also have a foreign policy. Europe is not united. There is no United States of Europe. We are going further away from it and we are not coming closer to it. So if you want to be polite, you cannot say anything intelligent and therefore I'm not trying to be polite. <laughs> ein bisschen schwierig mit diesem ernüchternden Befund. Right, it's a bit difficult to end on such a sobering note. I think we need to add something to that. Well, of course, I'm aware that there's still a large number of questions, comments and statements. But I think you will also understand that on the one hand, we can't really overtax our speakers here. And of course, all the other speakers uh, would be penalized in the following because we have used up the time. So. I believe it is also on your behalf that I would like to thank all speakers. Thank you for having given us insights. Thank you for having told us about the importance and the difficulties of this job of advisor. I think we should all continue. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't let this session end without thanking Brigadier Feichtinger for the excellent moderation. I would like to thank all panelists. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, time to listen to you longer, but Professor Schwefter, General Golan, and General Kandari will be giving individual presentations in the course of the conference, and you can always ask questions after they gave their presentation. We also have a question from a Facebook user for Mr. Schwefter. We are going to keep the question until further notice, and then we will tell the user that she will get the answer later. So thank you very much. This has been a highlight of our event. Now just stretch your legs for 45 minutes, and then uh, at 45 we'll meet again for Erich Durchmitt's presentation. And of course, there's a conference wine for the panelists. <laughs> Ich finde das nicht dem, was ich